the best way to learn a language? Immersion, living where the language is spoken and using it every day. But if that's not in the cards for you this year, you can still learn a language the second best way, and that's with Babbel. Be a better you in 2024 with Babbel, the science-backed language learning app that actually works. Don't pay hundreds of dollars for private tutors or waste hours on apps that don't really help you speak the language. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are handcrafted by over 200 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Babbel's designed by real people for real conversations. Babbel's tips and tools are approachable, accessible, rooted in real-life situations, and delivered with conversation-based teaching so you're ready to practice what you've learned in the real world. For instance, I've been using Babbel's convenient courses to help me learn basic conversational skills in German while I'm getting ready for a little trip I'm planning. It's not a language I'd ever studied before, but I find the lessons really easy and kind of like hand-holding me through learning a completely new language to me. And it's reassuring to know that with the help of Babbel, I'll be able to greet people, order food, and ask for directions without having to consult language apps. While I'm in Deutschland, I'm still learning. Studies from Yale, Michigan State University, and others continue to prove Babbel is better. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college. Babbel has over 16 million subscriptions sold. Plus, all of Babbel's 14 award-winning language courses are backed by their 20-day money-back guarantee. Here's a special limited-time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners, at babbel.com slash vulgar. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash vulgar, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash vulgar. Rules and restrictions may apply. Ah, the web tore. Those that both creators and were created by the threads disentangle from the fringes to feast on the very thing that spawned them. What's that, Siri? This is how you deal with will! No! Do not harm my children! Oh, you lost a feather. Can I keep it? No, you can't force me to! Do you know what lies within? Nothing. Rocket is in trouble, Akasa. Can can we turn on the windshield remotely? No, she could lose her job as Nakasar. I don't fear Vehar. No, but you fear me. If you intend to trick me, I will not hesitate to sever the oath bond entirely. Why didn't you help me? Coward! I don't have a parachute! I don't like free falling! Counterbalance, a high fantasy audio drama. Season 2, coming 15th of October 2023. Learn more on trilunas.com. Hello and welcome to Vulgar History, a feminist women's history comedy podcast. My name is Anne Foster and today I am sharing a chat that I had with uh, the author Joanna Hickson, who you may know as the author of, at this point... Uh, seven historical fiction novels, all of them set in approximately the 15th century England. A lot of them have to do with Tudor history, although in our chat, she explains how her first book is technically not about the Tudors. With the occasion of this chat was the paperback release of her most recent book, The Queen's Lady, which tells the story of a very interesting woman from the Tudor period named Joan Vox, who it's just incredible, this woman's story and also her connections to so many of the most famous events of the Tudor era, really. We also talk about Joanna's other books. So please enjoy this chat with author Joanna Hickson. Okay, so I am joined here today by Joanna Hickson, author of, I believe, is it seven books about Tudor women? Yes, it is. It's seven, although they weren't all Tudor because I began at the beginning oh, true. of the century and she was a French queen. Um, but then she um, married Owen Tudor and started the Tudor dynasty, really. Let's talk about that first. So your first book and who that was about. That was about Catherine de Valois, who was a French princess the, um, and married King Henry V. And that was after the Battle of Agincourt. And if you know your Shakespeare at all, um, you'll know that there was a lovely scene in that play between him and Catherine de Valois when she was offered to him as uh, a sort of uh, 
someone to send cement the uh, triumph of uh, Agincourt because he'd won over France. And so um, he, he, there's a lovely little scene when he woos her and she tries to push him off kind of thing at the end of Henry V, Shakespeare's Henry V. And that was really what brought me into the whole thing because... Uh, I read this at school. Uh, I, I studied uh, English, obviously, at school, and uh, I I loved this scene and I loved this character. Uh, and I thought, well, there must be a story in that. And so I went to research Catherine and how how she got on after all this happened. And um, then I wrote the book, um, which never got published at the time. It took uh-huh. about 20 years for me to get <laughs> published. <laughs> but then I had to rewrite it completely in a completely different way. But that was, that's, a, that's a long story. And, but that is the sort of basis of, because she, having uh, married Henry V and had Henry VI, who was the next king of England, um, Henry V died uh, very soon after that. And she was left a widow at 21 and um, obviously wasn't really wanting to stay that way all her life. So she eventually, but she was forbidden to marry um, because it was very awkward for the, the English uh, sort of people in charge of England at the time, and they didn't want her to marry, so they told her she shouldn't. And so she went off and she didn't marry at first, but she fell in love with this Welshman who was called Owen Tudor. And that's where the Tudor comes from, because eventually they did, we think they did marry, although there's no particular debt record of it. Uh, Mm -hmm. So that's the, the beginning of the Tudors, really. And that was my first book. I really love that that was what your first book was about. And you've continued on doing these kind of figures, like how you described her in the Shakespeare play, who have a small part in larger stories. And it just made you think, well, there's a larger story there. So you're really looking at this era that, I mean, there's it's so there's so many books about the Tudor era, but you're you're pulling out figures that haven't been examined to this extent. No, that's true. Um, and that at, at the time, that was even truer. But now there are quite a few books, uh, you know, about Catherine de Valois. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe it's a result of my, my writing one, but uh, I don't think so. Um, you know, there have been other books and and, and other uh, histori- historians have covered her. But but she, I mean, it's the sign that, that, that the women now becoming very important in history, much more important than they were when I first wanted to write about Catherine de Valois. Um, and that was what egged me on, really, because I thought well, it's time that, that women got a chance. You know, it's all very well doing these books about Henry V, but let's have a look at <laughs> who he married and what effect she had on history. And my goodness, it was quite an effect. Well, that's the thing. I love I love just from um, my own. I'm obviously I'm in Canada. I'm not in England. So I didn't study the tutors and things like that in school. It's all just been my personal interest. So just for me, going back to think to realize that it all comes back to Catherine falling in love with this Welsh. What was he? He was like, not a servant, he, something with the horses or something, but. He he was her, well, well, yes, he was a servant of hers in her household. And uh, I don't know what his role actually was, but I think he more or less ran the household. And he, he had been in, in the wars. He, he served in, at Agincourt. So he, you know, he had been a soldier and he, lots of those soldiers came up into Henry V's uh, and then into Catherine's households. So we don't know a lot about his background, although he did have, his parents were Welsh and he, he was born probably somewhere near Anglesey, if not in Anglesey, which is an island off the coast of, of, of Wales, but it is part of Wales. And, uh, and his brothers were involved in various revolts so there, there was plenty of history behind the family. Owen was, was a lucky one because he was sent to London to learn the law, which didn't happen very often in Wales because um, Welsh, there was no Welsh law. It, they were all under the English law at, at that time. So uh, he was, he was a, an educated man, but not uh, in any way uh, royal or, or have any connection with royalty. And that's why, like today... I mean, just the name Tudor brings to mind royalty. And it really just started with this with this Welsh man. Yes, exactly. And and, um, he was he was, uh, you know, he was called lots of different names by the chroniclers who 
had called him Tidia and Tudor and whatever they felt like saying because mm-hmm. the names were rather impronounceable by the English at the time. So Tudor was just the one that ended up being the one that was fixed. So your books, are they all in kind of pairs um, of yes, two? Yes, so that was the first one. And then I, there was a two. There was another one on her because I did two on her marriages. So she was married first to Henry V and I, I covered that. I covered her from birth, actually, with a lovely, my favourite character I've ever written, actually, was in this first book. Her name was Met and she was the wet nurse for Catherine de Valois. And she is an, uh, an invented character that I invented because I wanted to have somebody in her private life who knew everything about her and this this was a good way of doing it so she went but she went right through her life and then passed the, her death um and so the second book that i wrote about catherine was about her marriage to uh, and how it uh, to to owen tudor and how it developed which was quite a nice story or a very romantic story that's the most romantic story i've written <laughs> i have to say mm-hmm. you know it's historical novels it's quite hard to get nice bits of romance into them <laughs> oh no it is with all these arranged marriages and stuff but yeah that was truly a love match right like a royal that woman was, her servant it's inarguably that was clearly a love match that was definitely a love match yes and they had three and possibly four children i had her having four because i she had three boys and um i wanted her to have a girl so i gave her a girl but i, I did something with the girl that you have to read the book to find out anyway. <laughs> well, no, exactly. And that's where I, I was thinking, like, how can we carefully talk about your books without, which are based on history, but without spoiling things, exactly. especially because you're looking at figures who are not quite as well known. So so the Agincourt Bride and the Tudor Bride, those are the two about her. Yeah. And then your next duology um, was uh, Cecily Neville was the main yes. character. That's right, yes, but she was the, the, the almost queen. Um, she never actually managed to be queen, but her son was king. She had two sons who were kings, um, Edward IV and uh, Richard III. Uh, quite, quite famously, two of her sons were kings. Yes, yes, and she, uh, so she was an amazing character. I mean, that, she was a brilliant um, character to write because there was so much about her that was, was actually recorded which is very unusual for, for women, very hard to find, you know, records in, in research that will fulfil, you know, a, a major novel about them. Um, and and then quite a bit of making up sometimes has to go in, which, which I love doing anyway. But, um, it, you, you know, that's where the historian, the true historians, in inverted commas, tend to um, downplay historical fiction because they don't believe it's really history. But that's where I think figures like this, where there's not enough history to maybe write a traditional nonfiction biography about them, but the story has so many elements that makes them ideal for fiction. And that's the way you can make them better known, share their stories. Indeed. And and this, um, I mean, I think uh, Cicely was always pretty well known. She was from a very high ranking uh, aristocratic family uh, from the north of England. And she was the youngest of 22 children. I did not know that. Oh, my gosh. Oh, your face. <laughs> <laughs> 22. <laughs> your, your mouth dropped open. <laughs> um, yes, it, 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 there were two wives, actually. Um, so that perhaps makes it more obviously possible. Um, but, you know, still hard work, I think, for both of those wives. And mm. Cecily ended up being the youngest. Um, and as the youngest, um, her father, who was a high, high-ranking uh, aristocrat, as I said, managed to marry her to the richest duke in in the country, and that was the Duke of York. And therefore, you know, she she he was quite close to the throne, but not close enough to actually get there. And she, this is why people called her the the not quite queen. She was never able to actually get onto the throne uh, as queen, but she did manage to put two sons on the throne, so that was good. <laughs> I mean, that that was one whole book, a separate book. Yes, that's um, yeah. There, there wasn't a two. I seem to write um, sequels to to books um, because I, I I end up finding that there's so much to to write about that I want to to cover a life 
fully and properly. And your books are going somewhat, they're going exactly in chronological order, right? Yes. Yeah, through the the history of this period. So the Catherine, yes. and then Cecily, and then, yeah. So that's the Wars of the Roses book, yeah. really, because her, you know, she lived through the Wars of the Roses. And also, she was involved in the, the well, she wasn't involved in the battles, obviously, but but I managed to, to get the battles in by, by giving her a, a knight who was her sort of special knight. And he fought the battles for her and, and came back and told her all about them. Because you, you, it's hard when you're, you're writing about women to actually ever write about a battle, actually on the battlefield. Yeah. And jumping forward into the into the next two books that came after that one, those were the books that I had to get onto battlefields, and I had to have male uh, characters through her, throughout the books in order to to write about the Wars of the Roses. And so that I actually ended up making men very forward characters in in these books, but they obviously had female attachments as well. So mm. I, I haven't just written about about women, <laughs> not entirely, but those two books, the the, um, the first of the Tudors and uh, Tudor, the Tudor Crown, were about the sort of move of the the Tudors into. Um, royalty into into the court, and then then the loss the loss of their thrones, uh, they were thrown first of all, and then uh, King Henry the the seventh, his king who is the center at the center of the present two books that that I've just written. Yes, and so the sort of the tie in why we're talking today is because the paperback has just come out for the Queen's Lady, and I absolutely I've read these books, I super recommend them. But I do think that it works best, The Queen's Lady, in conjunction with the previous book, The Lady of the Ravens. So can you explain who the main character is in these books? Because it was a figure I've never encountered before in Tudor history. I've never heard of her. No, it's another It's another find that I made when I was doing my research, it's obviously. Um, and I discovered her because um, she turned up in the household of the mother of King Henry VII, became King Henry VII. His mother, of course, was Margaret Beaufort. Her na- her name was Margaret Beaufort, and she was she was married actually to Edmund Tudor, and that's where the link to the, for the Tudors goes through. So that her son, the only one she had at age thirteen, was a Tudor. That's where the Tudor name came into the English throne. <laughs> really, I'd like to point out that. The protagonist in those two books about the Wars of the Roses were men, and then I, I came out of those and out of Margaret Beaufort's household came this girl who was called Joan Vaux, and I didn't really think about her to start with. I just thought, oh, she's you know she's um, looking after Elizabeth of York, who was supposed to marry or who did marry Henry the Seventh, and there was a time when she was living with Margaret Beaufort um, and waiting to marry Henry VII. And that's really the start of the first book. She's, she's found in, in Margaret Beaufort's house um, as Elizabeth of York's companion and maid, really. Um, and her name is Joan Vaux. And Joan Vaux turns out to be the most incredible character. I mean, she... You, you know, you couldn't make it up in, in any way. It's all real. I mean, she has all her, all that I write about her in my fiction, practically all of it is real. It actually happened. And, and, and so that was the kind of, that was, that was great. But I also added a few things in that just to make it a bit more exciting. So Joan Fox became Lady Guilford, Lady Joan Guilford, um, when she married, she was almost forced to marry um, this man called Richard Guilford, Sir, Sir Richard Guilford. He was a knight of Henry the uh, court. Um, he was a very close friend of Henry the and had several very important posts that he he operated in in the court. So um, he he was an important figure, and um, because Elizabeth of York after she married Henry VII, wanted Joan to be in one of her close companions and, and ladies-in-waiting. 
but she couldn't be a lady in waiting unless she had a title. She was either the daughter of a of a titled family or she had married a, a, a knight at least. And so she was, although she she really didn't want to get married at all, she had to marry in order to be um, this lady in waiting to Queen Elizabeth of York. Could you talk um, about, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I just want to make sure that you discuss also why she didn't want to get married, how educated she was, what um, oh, her yes, background. Yeah. <laughs> <Because she, laughs> she, she, well, we could start at the beginning of her life because yeah. this is really what these two books are about. And her life, I mean, she she's a remarkable woman because actually she lived until she was 75 or 76, which is uh, remarkable for a woman in that period. And so she covered a lot of the Tudor ground and, and she remained very important in the Tudor uh, court and in the, the Tudor story, mostly through the women, because she she was a lady-in-waiting, as I said. She became lady-in-waiting to uh, Queen Elizabeth of York and a very close friend of hers. And uh, having married this Sir Richard Guilford, she had a child whose name was Henry because his father wanted him to be called after the king, um, which meant that everybody in the world was called Henry, who was masculine. <laughs> so so uh, I, I had um, Joan call her child Hal because it meant that he, at least we knew who he was as opposed to all the Henrys that were around him. Anyway, that's a, a side, side story. But um, the amazing thing about her was her education. And she, she was, and we don't know where she was born because her mother was Italian. And her mother came into the country in the household of Queen Marguerite, as I call her, Queen Marguerite of uh, who of Anjou, who was married to King Henry the Sixth, and uh, she came in through her court with her mother. Um, so her mother married one of the the uh, knights in that court, and so she was um, able to be called an English citizen because she was born in England to a woman who was also uh, was Italian, but was living and married to an Englishman. And so there she is in the court of uh, Henry VI. But on the way to, to doing that, she, she was probably born during the Wars of the Roses when the English court had fled to Europe because... Henry the uh, sorry um, Edward the Fourth had come into the country and was um, on the throne, and therefore the Lancastrians had lost their power and were shoved out, and a lot of them fled to Europe, and among them was um, the father of Joan, uh, this Joan of, of uh, Vaux. His his name was Vaux, and. Um, we don't know where she was born, but probably in Piedmont, which is part of Italy now, but it's the other side of the Alps to Anjou, which, which is where her mother eventually, <laughs> it's all very complicated, but basically she learned two languages before she even left Europe. So she was a child in, a, in an Italian um, country and uh, she, she learned Italian and then she moved into France with her mother when her mother went to um, the court of the exile court of Margaret of Anjou. And she joined the children's schoolroom there and learned French. So she had two languages then. Then she came eventually across to England. And that's a long story, but I, I cut it very short because her father was killed in the battle, one of the battles of the Wars of the Roses. So she she became um, a, 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 an orphan basically because her mother, well, people, children who uh, whose father died in those days were orphaned, whether their mother was alive or not. And um, her mother was alive, of course, but her mother was really almost attached um, in skin to Queen Marguerite and wouldn't leave her and couldn't leave her. I mean, Marguerite was desperate because her husband. Uh, was she didn't know where he was, but he was in the Tower of London, and her, her son, the Prince Edward that she had had with him, who was supposed to be the next King of England, had died on the battlefield as well. So she was fraught, and she was taken to the Tower of London as a prisoner, and begged 
uh, her, Catherine Vaux, Joan's mother, to come with her. So she ended up in the Tower of London um, and Ka Joan ended up um, in Margaret Beaufort's house, household um, because Margaret Beaufort was still in London and just about hanging on to some sort of life because Edward IV was on the throne. So during that period, um, she learned English, quite obviously, because everybody was speaking English. And she also learned Latin because there was a fantastic library in Margaret Beaufort's house. And it was filled with books. And most of the books were in Latin because that was the, the educational and collegiate and court language of Europe. So she learned Latin as well. So that's four languages she had. Now, I don't think there was another woman in England at that time who had even two languages, mm -hmm. let alone four. So that was pretty amazing. And it got her a long way in life. <laughs> and now we're just going to take a break for a word from our sponsors. As a podcast network, our first priority has always been audio and the stories we're able to share with you. But at Realm, we also sell some pretty cool merch, and organizing that was made both possible and easy with Shopify. When you think about successful businesses like Allo or Allbirds or Skims, an often overlooked secret is the business behind the business that makes selling and, for shoppers, buying simple. For millions of businesses, that business is Shopify. That's because nobody does selling better than Shopify. It's the home of the number one checkout on the planet. And the not-so-secret secret that's definitely worth talking about is that ShopPay boosts conversions up to 50%. That's more happy customers and way more sales going. If you're hoping to grow your business, your commerce platform better be ready to sell wherever your customers are scrolling or strolling, on the web, in your store, in their feed, and everywhere in between. Businesses that sell more sell on Shopify. Upgrade your business and get the same checkout we use with Shopify. Sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash realm, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash realm to upgrade your selling today. Shopify.com slash realm. Contained herein are the heresies of Radolf Buntwine, erstwhile monk turned traveling medical investigator. Join me as I study the secrets of the divine plagues and uncover the blasphemous truth that ours is not a loving God and we are not its favored children. The Heresies of Radolf Bantwine, wherever podcasts are available. People often look at me with confusion when I ask them what their only one in the room story is. They think it has to be like mine, where I went to a 600 person event and discovered that I was the only black person there. I know, horrifying, right? Hi, I'm Laura Cathcart Robbins, and I am the host and creator of the podcast Only One in the Room. Every week, my co host Scott Slaughter and I invite you to join us for an hour and lose yourself in someone's only one story. This podcast is for anyone who's ever felt alone in a room full of people, which is to say that this podcast is for everyone. And we're back. And I just the the idea of growing up in the house of Margaret Beaufort, who is such a interesting and smart woman, like just thinking what the influence of that would be. Of course, of course, Joan would be. She would have the ability to uh, educate herself in a way that so many other young women just wouldn't have. But also not just book learning, but just kind of learning how to behave in a court, you know, how to be resilient, all those things that Margaret Beaufort was really known for. She did indeed, and that that was a great help to her. And, and she was uh, Margaret Beaufort was very fond of her too, and and very fond of her mother. And uh, they were best friends because they'd served Marguerite of Anjou when they were in her court years before. So they were friends, and there's you know all these links in, in the courts of, of that at that time were, were quite interesting. Um, so, but but if you're following Joan, I mean Joan was once she had married. Uh, into um, the sort of royal situation. She could become a lady-in-waiting, as she was Lady 
Guildford, Lady Joan Guildford. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and she also, because of this, um, had an apartment in the, the Tower of London. So Sir Richard Guildford was had this house in the Tower of London, so Joan was able to live with him there because he was the master of ordnance and armaments, which was the king's, uh, obviously, one of his main uh, appointments. It's very important when you're trying to hold on to your throne to have a good a good man in that position. So um, they lived in a house in the Tower of London, and that's why the first book of these two is called The Lady of the Ravens, because, as we all know, um, the ravens were a very important part of the, of the uh, Tower of London's life, um, and it was there was it was believed that by the by the locals in London that if the ravens left the tower, um, the tower would fall, and and so would the kingdom. So, you know, the, the whole point of of having the ravens there was was to keep them there for this reason, and and Joan became very fond of them anyway. But that's all in the book, so uh, mm-hmm. if you. If anyone's interested, they can read it. Uh, but the one thing I did find very um, enjoyable was uh, researching the, the ravens in the tower. And I went and visited the the, the raven master, who is a man, a man, a very nice man indeed. Um, and he has written his own book. And his name is Chris Scaife. And he uh, has written his own book about the ravens. But he very kindly showed me all their tricks and, and uh, things. And it was, it was I had a great time in, in the Tower of London. I want to say, sorry, just to the listeners, um, having read The Lady of the Ravens, the I can tell that you you interacted with the actual ravens, the the writing about them. It's very interesting and lots of interesting details. Mm, well, they mostly come from Chris Gave. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, so anyway, the, so she there she was set up in her Tower of London, and um, as a result of this, serving the Queen as well, that was difficult because I mean the Queen travels around the country. She, she had to go with her. She wasn't always with her husband. They had a very sort of patchy marriage, but it seemed to work vaguely. He also grew very fond of her, but he he'd already had six children by his first wife. He was an older man, and. Um, they, he had uh, properties uh, down in Kent, um, and it was a nice, n- another nice piece of research that I was able to do to go to Kent and to look at the, the places in which they lived um, and, and where they own, which they owned. Um, but there was one house that I was particularly interested in because it had actually belonged to Joan, not to her her husband, uh, but to Joan and. It turned out that he had actually given it to her um, the year after their wedding because he had admired her ability to look after his six children and and be his wife. And he found he, he this was her reward. He gave her this house. And it was a manor and, and, and the manor that went with it. And so that proved very important later on in her life when she needed it. Um, that, that came in the second book. Mm-hmm. Well, my question actually is, when you finished the first one, did you know you were going to do a second one about her? Yes. Yes, I did, because I knew that there was a big story there. Yeah. You know, that, that it, it was, you know, impossible not to to do two books because they were so different. I mean, I think, you know, the, the, the book where she actually is at the court and is and, and, and the court is um, straining uh, against all these um conspiracies against the new king because Henry the Seventh of course came in and nobody knew who he was. I mean who is this Tudor man who's just suddenly sat on the throne? You know, they it was a very difficult time in that court. And um and when he married Elizabeth, um there was a lot of Yorkist um thought that she should be the queen, not him, the king. So that's a, a another storyline. And of course, um, Joan went through all this and, and went through all most of uh, Queen Elizabeth's pregnancies, not all of which were, were happy. So there, there was that side of it as well. But um, also her son, her own son, who she managed to have and never had another, sadly, another child. Um, but she had an appointment because of her connections in the, the, the nursery of the, the king's family. In which is which was an Elton Palace, um, which is just outside London, 
and um, she became governess to the to the girls uh, who were born to that to the king's marriage, and um, that was another sort of angle for her uh, importance in the court. And her son went with her and became a very close friend of the next king. Was we didn't know it was going to be him then, but but it was Henry the Eighth eventually, and so he was a good close friend of Henry the Eighth's. Which it was was you know, really pretty pretty well um, made Joan important as well, and because she was so educated and and spoke all these languages, she met Erasmus, who was the important um, scholar of Europe at the time, and he came came into England and wanted to visit uh, the children of the king to see how how their education was and what 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 they were representing. And uh, he he met Joan there, and he he found her very interesting, and spoke long with her on the two visits that he made, and um, wrote later to tell the the world that this this had happened. So that again was an important bit of, of think of research that I could get into the book. It it was massively important. She was massively important to that family, that family of. Uh, kings, queens, and princes, and princesses. The second book, if we move on to that, I mean, she 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 actually served for four Tudor queens, which is a, a remarkable achievement, really. And she also managed to do it despite the fact that her husband was in, was put in jail for apparently being an um, embezzler of royal funds. So, I mean, it, it, was, a, it was a very active life. <laughs> I was just thinking um, when I was reading the books and then later just quickly reading a bit about her historical biography. I mean, what a gift to you as a writer of historical fiction. All the situations she lived through, just one after another. Like, And the fact that she maintained her importance and her role really speaks to how valued she was, how trusted she was. But just the amount like you get into, again, I don't want to spoil the books, but there's so much happening in that royal court and she's right there. And she would have been in real life. Yes, and that was what was so so marvelous to discover because because as you say, it hadn't really been shown. And the funny thing is that um, Holbein, you know, came into the court of Henry VIII um, and painted all these paintings of people. And there is a painting um, of Joan Guilford oh. uh, among them, but it's not Joan. It's it's actually the 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 wife of her son. Oh. Mm-hmm. Um, sadly, uh, you know, because a lot of people think that that is Joan, and I'm very happy to be able to tell the world that it isn't, because actually she's not very beautiful, and and not not, and I think Joan was probably a lot more handsome than this woman <laughs> who was painted by Holbein. It's a great shame, really, but uh, but it means that she wasn't uh, in history. She hasn't been so important because there isn't a portrait of her in the court. And I think that's imp- that that's important to say because uh, you know women didn't have, however clever and, and brilliant they were, they didn't have the uh, I suppose the pizzazz in the court, and it wasn't it didn't get through down to history until later. And I'm just curious to know again not to not to spoil your book, but how you chose to end the second book, knowing that she was going to go on to live to be seventy six. How you decided where to end that book? I'm just curious. Well, the second marriage that she had, because of course um, I still have to tell other people who don't know, is that her her first husband died on a pilgrimage to uh, Jerusalem, and um, she didn't learn of his death for two years because uh, it was after he'd been in in jail, uh, and uh, he he was trying to make amends with God. And he even failed to do that, poor thing, because he died the day after he arrived in Jerusalem. And he never got to the to the place where he wanted to go to uh, say sorry to God and Jesus and everybody else. That he had um, made a mess of the end of his life. So um, he he was a sad case in in the in that in that way. But Joan did find. A, a romance later in life, in her life, a real romance with this much younger man who was a a lawyer and also um, a merchant seaman. He had a, a business in in Bristol, 
which covered the, whatever the, of the world there was to cover uh, the ocean. And he became, in fact, uh, later on, um, a, a, the vice admiral of, of the country. Uh, he was quite important in his in his uh, way too. But uh, his, his the house where he was born and where he lived a great much of his life is just down the road from where I live. And so um, it, it's it's nice to be able to write about a place that I've been to several times. It's a beautiful um, Tudor house. Well, it's not actually terribly beautiful, but it is a, a very amazing Tudor house that was built for specifically almost a lot of it was built for um, Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII to have their one of their honeymoon uh, stays in. And, and so it, it is quite remarkable for that as well. So, um, but that that's much later on. So it's not in the book actually. But I mean, she, but Joan was very much. He lived there with with her second husband, whose name was Anthony, Anthony Poins. And um, the second part of her life, I think, was much was not nearly as exciting, but must have been much more convenient for her and much happier, I think, than mm-hmm. than the, the the first part. Although she she was she was very resilient, I think. Uh, and and she wouldn't have expected to be, you know, a happy, in love um, wife. Nobody did in those days, really. Um, it was very lucky if you were, but she did. She did actually succeed in in being that um, in her second marriage. Well, and that's that makes total sense to me. Then to there is so much going on around her, and that would be the contents of these books. But then when she's not just she settles down, but kind of the country settles down a bit. Um, once Henry VIII takes over, there's a period. I mean, not that there's not conspiracies and things going on, but it's a bit more like, okay, we have a king. And he's young and he's handsome and he's, yeah. you know, he's go-getting. Yeah. Um, and that's what the country needed. Exactly. And then, time, and then, of course, at that time, you know, he was very much in love with Catherine of Aragon. And it, it was expected that there would be lots of healthy children. <laughs> we know how that turned out yes we do but I actually my reason for for not going further you know through Joan's life in that that period was I didn't really want to move into the Anne Boleyn um mm-hmm. the, what they call the great matter I didn't want I mean I do mention it in the book but I I didn't I didn't want to to, to write about it and to use it uh, in my Tudor uh, series because uh, it's been done yeah, I mean, everybody's done it, and I, I think it was having found Joan. I didn't really want to um, sort of give her Anne Boleyn to cope with, <laughs> and she didn't have to anyway. <laughs> well, and that's where I find, um, like, having read these two books and just knowing about your other books, you're really kind of coloring in lesser discussed little corners of this Tudor saga that a lot of you know historical fiction fans would already know about. So, if people want to read about Anne Boleyn, there's Many, <laughs> many other books. Yes. Whereas there are not plenty of books to read about Joan of Forks, Guildford, Poins. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So again, like the so the paperback has just come out of the Queen's Lady, which is the second book in this duology. And that I called her that. I mean, there was a lot of discussion between my editor and 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 uh, other people in the, in in the uh, business of publicating publishing this book about what we should call it. And having decided to call it the Queen's Lady, we then had an argument about where the the uh, uh, apostrophe should go, <laughs> which is Fair. ridiculous, really. <laughs> And I think it's in completely the wrong place, <laughs> but it, it's it that's where it is, and uh, you know that's what publishers do. Um, they say that's that's how it'll be, and so that's how it'll be. <laughs> mm-hmm. True, and, because she was the lady of more than one queen. Four yeah. at the yeah. time, yes. Yeah. And, and I I thought that it should be it should have been after the S and not before the S. But then, I mean, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> yeah, everybody knows what it says. I know we need to wrap things up pretty quickly, but if you could just, well, I guess in as much time as you want to take, explain what it was like writing this book during quarantine lockdown. Yes, it uh, it was good actually. Um, I think the I think the lockdown was quite good for writers in, in general, unless unless they they got sort of sick or something. But um, I didn't I didn't I did manage to escape all that. So 
I'm what's called a COVID virgin, I think. <laughs> you know, I, I I found it quite good to be able to uh, use the time. And I must say, um, now that we're all out and about again and doing a lot of things um, that we used to do before uh, COVID, I'm finding it very difficult because now I'm writing another series of books, another pet too, uh, about the Seymours. And, um, I, I, you know, I'm finding it much more difficult to actually uh, get that down on, on the computer than I found doing Joan. Now, it's, I don't think it's because um, I haven't got the character that Joan was and I, I wanted very much to cover her life. Uh, it's because, I mean, I want to do the Seymour. They're very interesting as well. And, and not much known is known about them and how they got to where they got. So um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fine, but I'm finding it much more difficult, you know, now that we're not in lockdown <laughs> to actually get that all down because I have so many other things going on in my life. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we, we got quite quiet during lockdown. So <laughs> for me, it was actually probably a very good thing. I don't know. Yeah. And also, people bought books. So, you know, when you got the first, when we got the first book out, the, the sales were good because that was the beginning of lockdown. And Right. Uh, yeah. And everybody was reading. <laughs> so that was nice. Yeah. I would say that uh, it didn't really do me any harm. No, it's fair enough. And it, it just does put me in the mind of, I don't think this is a major plot point in these books, but historically, the various pandemics and plagues that happened, I think a lot of people, you know, Shakespeare and people would just sort of lock them. It's like, what can I do? But just write. It's it kind of puts me in the mind of of writers from 400 years ago to just, well, I guess I'll just write some books because everybody's staying at home. That's exactly it. Yes. I mean, there were there were obviously the the, the, the sweat was the, the big thing in the in the Tudor reign. And um, I didn't actually cover that because it didn't actually affect Joan. Um, but uh, it, it, it was pretty important. But it it, it was only a, a toward the end of my books that I would have used it at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it didn't exist before that. And some people said, oh, it must have been what killed Prince Arthur. But it wasn't because uh, it, it wasn't there yet. We, it hadn't arrived. So, you know, we're still that's still a mystery as to what he died of. Well, and that's just it kind of speaks to uh, the amount of things that were going on when Joan of Ox was there. So much happened during her life that you could just pick and choose which things to include in your book, which I think is, again, really a gift as a writer. It definitely is. Yes. I mean, you know, my timeline was was easy Um, and I always do a timeline, you know, before I start really to see what happened around in the world and where where she could fit into it. So it it was a good timeline. (laughs) I mean, everything by the time. Um, anyway, I won't get into all the details of it, but just know if you if you are um, if you've a fan, I guess, of this time period, it's interesting to see some events that I've heard about before. But how did Joan encounter them? What did she think about them? It's interesting to see them from this new point of view. Good. Well, um, I hope people will, you know, get on and read them. <laughs> I, they, I, they, they should. <laughs> <laughs> I mistook the um, dates when the books are going to be available, that this the paperback book is going to be available in um, Canada and the US. They're, they're not actually coming to um, the North Americans, Americas uh, until um, I think it's um, April. Okay. I don't know why. But still soon, but people yeah. can buy them and... But there is a, 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 a the moment as we speak. There is a, an ab, an Amazon deal on the Kindle book. Mm-hmm. If anyone you know wants to spend ninety nine p ninety nine p well spent, I would say. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. It was really uh, an honor and a pleasure to get to talk to you. And I I just want to say to the listeners, the amount of information that you know off the top of your head <laughs> about this time period is, is truly impressive to me. I always get sort of tangled up with like, as you said, everyone is called Henry or Edward or Margaret. I just, it always takes me a minute to think, which one is this? And you just, off the top of your head, it's very impressive. You have to name them. They're, you have to give them proper names, uh, you know, different names to uh, mostly it's uh, it's pen names or 
you know, funny little names that they uh, you can use. And that's that's the way they used to do it then, too. <laughs> True. If everyone has the same name, you have to. I will yes. just let the listeners know as well, at the beginning, at least in the edition I read of your book, there is a list of cast of characters. <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to me. This has really well, been a pleasure. I really, I really enjoyed both of your books, and I'm absolutely going to read the other ones now, too. Oh, good. That's good. <laughs> well, thank you, you so much. It. Yeah. Bye. Bye. So I'm not going to list all of Joanna Hickson's book titles here. They're all listed in the show notes to this episode. And specifically the books we were talking about, about Joan Vox, are Lady of the Ravens and then The Queen's Lady. And so The Queen's Lady, it's out in paperback now in the UK. Um, It's going to be coming out in paperback in North America on May 30th. But you can also purchase it, you know, in hardcover or there's the ebook, there's the audiobook, lots of ways that you can enjoy this book. And I've got links to, in the notes as well. If you want to buy a copy of it through bookshop.org, which a uh, little bit of money from the purchases you use using that link goes to support this show on Vulgar History and me. So you can keep up with Joanna Hickson. She's on Twitter at Joanna Hickson. She's also on Facebook. Same thing, Joanna Hickson. And you can keep up with me and the show on Vulgar History. We are on Instagram at Vulgar History Pod, also on TikTok at Vulgar History. And yeah, I've got a bunch more special chats coming up with authors, historians, other history enthusiasts about a bunch of various topics. And thank you so much for listening. If you want to support the show, also, we're selling merch at vulgarhistory.store. And you can also join the Patreon where you can get bonus episodes where I talk about costume dramas and men, horrible men from history. That's at patreon.com slash Ann Foster writer. Anyway, I will be back next week with another super special episode. And until then, keep your pants on and your tits out. Vulgar History is hosted, written, and researched by Ann Foster and edited by Christina Lumagi. Talmor, Sheshin Mugachi. Talmor is my home. My family have worked the land for generations. My grand says the island does not belong to us, but we belong to the island. And we must be ready, for a great evil is coming. And death follows with it. Listen and subscribe to the latest season of Undertow, The Harrowing, a story glass production presented by Realm, available wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, I'm Jennifer, a founder of the Go Kid Go Network. At Go Kid Go, putting kids first is at the heart of every show that we produce. That's why we're so excited to introduce a brand new show to our network called The Search for the Silver Lining, a fantasy adventure series about a spirited young girl named Isla who time travels to the mythical land of Camelot. Look for the search for the silver lining on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Brennan Storr. I'm Paul Bestall. We're the Ghost Story Guys. And every two weeks, we explore first-person stories of encounters with the paranormal from all around the world. Then we have some fun reacting to those stories. We like to say our goal is to scare the hell out of you, then make you laugh. Belief in the paranormal is not required. All you need is a love of great storytelling and curiosity about the world around you. Subscribe to the Ghost Story Guys now on your favorite podcatcher to hear episodes like High Strangeness in Chicago, The Mystery of Missing Time, and The Haunting of Vietnam, along with dozens of others. We've talked about mythical bridges, doppelgangers, haunted seaside towns, and so much more. Remember that story about the guy who was trapped inside a dream and something was hunting him? That was... that was upsetting. Yes. Yes, it was. Want us to help ruin your sleep? Come find the Ghost Story Guys on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else fine podcasts live or at ghoststoryguys.com.